All right, welcome back everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our next instructor. Um, if you didn't get to hear her yesterday, you're in for a real treat. This is Miss Jennifer Shea. Jennifer Shea is our general counsel at the Louisiana Legislative Auditor's Office. Jennifer represents the legislative auditor and our staff in those matters where they're called to testify and or to, to produce records for further inquiry by state and federal courts. She advises the Louisiana Legislative Audit Advisory Council on relevant audit issues. Because of her governmental background, Jennifer has a broad knowledge of the processes of government and the relationships between the various branches of state and local government. Jennifer is also a certified fraud examiner. Please welcome Ms. Jennifer Shea. morning how is everybody this morning i hope good um i enjoyed my presentation with some or all of you yesterday i got several calls yesterday afternoon so even though i'm talking to this little machine i assume it's my conclusion that some of you are there because people called and said hey i saw you there yesterday so happy that you are there and happy that that we can work together on an issue that is very important i know to you and that is the local government budget act um somebody told me once that a good speech it's like a comment if it's really a good speech it's like a comment it's dazzling it's eye-opening and it's over before you know it so I'm hoping that this meets that criteria. We are going today to talk about the government, um, but before in the budget, but before I do that, I just want to say to you from myself personally, that we're very happy that we could meet you, even though it's somewhat inadequate. And I like being person to person, but we think that this has worked out really well with us doing the CLGE in this manner. And kind of like here, like in your area, nobody does this alone. In the auditor's office, I always say it takes a village. And it has, I'm giving the talks, the other speakers have given the talks, but I wanna tell you, we could not have done it without all the people that are helping us. You've been seeing Lizzie Shake Snyder, You've heard from Andre Taylor at various times. We have a, another one of our administrators here, Megan Kelly, and one of our IT people, Craig Wiseman. And so I wanna publicly in front of all of you, thank them because they've done a marvelous job to help us to communicate with you. And we look forward to continuing this kind of communication. So, you sit back and let's talk about the thing people always want to talk about, which is money. They say, remember that money might not be the most important thing, but nobody can remember who came in second. So what we hope today is to do is to define the elements of the Local Government Budget Act, to look at some implementation and kind of hypothetical practicing, and then consequences of non-compliance. Um, I didn't say it because I think most of you know it, but I wanna say my phone number is 225-339-3871, and my email is jshayshaye at LLA, dot la dot gov so those ways we can communicate also lizzie will be taking any questions that you might have as we go along and i'm happy to answer those questions if i can if the questions seem very particular and 
fact specific to your area? I mean, they can be facts, but I mean, something that's really unique to your area might be better if we chat offline one to one, but please don't let me say something today that causes confusion. Help me if I've caused confusion, help me to get it straight and I will appreciate it. Also want to make sure you know that everything we're talking about, almost everything, is in our frequently asked questions, which are, is, are all on our website. And I was reading them over in preparation for today, and I think they're all accurate. I think they all are linked properly. But if you see something there that's not okay, you're going to also tell us about that. Um, in this whole idea of the looking at the budget, one, one thing we have to know is it's not, I said it's money, but it's really recognizing the resources that we have and it's appropriating those resources and then spending those resources. So it's recognizing the resources, appropriating them, and then spending them. I like to help myself remember, so I call it RAS, R-A-S. And you wanna, you wanna make sure that you look at that and think about that as we're going through it. I, I say about public bid, I say about this, don't let your eyes glaze over. We're gonna talk common sense about this. So I just said something about public bid. I wanna clarify from yesterday that $250,000 is the contract limit in the public bid situation, but that um, I said yesterday, uh, it was a little unclear about in excess of what the statute now says. It's to that the new men, the new minimum is $250,000, which is um, equal to the sum of. So it says the, the minimum bid is equal to the sum of 250000 I had to read that to make sure I'm right. And then in the beginning of that section, it says you shall anything in excess of the minimum is to be bid. So if you have 250,000 project, 250,000 and one cent, you're gonna bid it. Now, here's the advice the auditor gives. If you're getting close to that 250,000 and you have that 250,000 plus in your budget or just right under, go ahead and bid that thing so that you don't have a problem where some curmudgeon in your community says you didn't do it right. Everything that we're going to do back to the uh, Local Government Budget Act, everything that we're going to do here is going to be based upon open meetings, transparency, and accountability. That's the environment that we're going to be working in. We cannot do the budget. We cannot do the budget in the back room, smoky filled back room. You cannot do the budget without the lights being on. You cannot do the budget in some way that it's just between me and you. The budget is a real legal document that is to be developed in an open meeting context with everyone in that community being able to respond to it to offer their views of it. So that, that I think is, goes with the next slide I'm gonna show you. And y'all probably gonna say, can she, she doesn't know any other part of the constitution, but this thing about the use of money in the constitution. Well, that's the basis of everything, not everything maybe, but that's the basis of about 75 or 80% of everything we do, certainly the basis of the budget. The budget says it's, it is public money 
that we're now going to uh, appropriate for the use of the public. It's not going to be money that's going to be loaned or pledged or donated, but public money. Therefore, then, what is it? It's simple. It's a plan for spending developed by fiduciaries and trustees that are on those boards. And you say, well, I'm the clerk. I'm not the trustee. But you're the one that's going to help prepare it. You're the one that's going to help the mayor or the head of that local government or the police jury or the political entity develop it. So we're all, we all have, as they say, skin in the game. This is what the, this budget is about. But what else? Remember the most I've said to you a really important word yesterday when we're talking about public bid, and that is the six letter word, public. This is a budget. This is a legal instrument that's not my money, not your money, not your assets, but it is the assets, it is the money of the public. And so we're developing it, we're developing it holding someone else's money. Does that kind of put a little strain on you thinking about that? Wow, somebody else's money. This is not you sitting at your office at your home or sitting at your dining room table deciding how much you're going to spend for Christmas. This is someone else's money. And that's why there are policies and procedures and time deadlines in all of this. Because the Local Government Budget Act is, in fact, a planning tool. It is a planning tool, but it's a planning tool that doesn't go in the trash. It's right up there if we could have, like, Las Vegas light flashing lights. This is what is the underpinning of what made the guy pick up the garbage at my house today. This is the underpinning of how public transportation works. This is the underpinning of all infrastructure changes that will happen in your community and my community. This is the basis. Now you say, well, wait, 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 stop. The legislature does the budget, right? They do. They do the budget for the whole state, but you all, mostly talking to local government, I'm assuming, you all do the budget for Ponchatoula. You do the budget for Hammond. We, in Baton Rouge, they do the budget for East Baton Rouge Parish. This is the plan. This is not something that's spontaneous. This is not something that can happen in an instant. It takes significant and in important planning. To use um, a sports analogy, uh, I like football. They always say the best football players, the best coaches in football, they watch a lot of film. They take everything that happened last Saturday and I like to, I'm going to take it. I have it recorded at my house because I want to see LSU beat Florida about 30 more times. But in budget planning, it is they take each segment as you do, as they do in football, each segment. Look at what did we do here? What did we do there? What, did, what revenues did we have? So budget planning is critical. It, it requires critical thinking because you don't just say like we did it last time. Ah, I forgot to tell you at the beginning and my friend Andre is holding it up. This is the first verification code for this talk. It's verification code number 33 and it's 7358, 7358 
verification code number 33. Thanks very much. So what we're looking at in going back to our planning is what will make this village, this town, this city, this parish, this political entity better. This is not a situation where we're going to say, um, we've always done it this way. Let's just do it this way. So I hate that anyway in life. When people tell me, when I say, why? Why do you do that? And somebody said, well, we've always done it this way. What does that say? That, that could say, making no judgment on you, but that could say, I'm really not thinking about this. I'm operating like a robot. That's not what you want to do in budget planning. You want to critically think, how can I make my entity better? And that's where, that's where we start. So let's look at now kind of a, in summary, I like to do summaries in between, of what is a public budget? It's a legal document, yes. It's done within open meeting in, in, in a public atmosphere. It's a public document. It's not something that belongs to the mayor, doesn't even belong to the council. It belongs to all of us. They hold it as fiduciaries, as trustees, but it's a public document. And it's a plan, a legal plan for accounting for revenues and expenditures of the political subdivision. And it's a complete financial plan. At some point, there's an AG opinion. You'll see it in our FAQs where somebody said, it's too hard to make a budget for one year. I just want to make it for six months. Now, actually, that, you know, somebody might say, oh, let me do that because I never keep it. When I make my New Year's resolution, it'd be, it'd be better if I made it a day at a time. But with the budget, because of the accountability, the transparency, and giving everybody a fair shot at what our plan is, it's a plan for the complete year. And your year might start July 1, or it might start January 1, or some other date. But that's what the budget is. It's a, it's a complete plan for your particular fiscal year. It's a plan where revenues and expenditures, unlike at my house, revenues and expenditures are equal. Revenues and expenditures have to be equal. You say, well, wait, wait, is that right? Because there's always going to be cash flow issues. That's correct. But what we're trying for is at the beginning, and as we look at the progress, we're never going to have a budget, or we shouldn't, where we have more expenditures than we have revenues coming in. If that happens, you have a legal obligation to amend the budget. And we'll talk about that in more detail, but I'll tell you this. Legal obligation to amend the budget is something that's universally hard for people to do because they just don't want to take the time to do it. But it is critical to making sure the budget is what the statutory mandate says it is, a legal budget, which is a complete picture of the finances of that particular community. And it is completeness where you look at the whole, which your auditors are going to be looking at. They're always looking at that because that's the only way you can get a fair picture of what has occurred. Let's look now is how, how do we use the budget? If we happen to come through this whole process and get this budget in place, what is it? Well, first it's a control mechanism. You're looking at the budget, you have $100 in there for a uh, salary, just have to be simple, simple number. $100 in there for salary, and I see that 
somebody wants to be hired for $150. Well, I can't do it, right? Because I don't have the money. You say, well, I could, I could transfer money. You could, depending on whether the council agrees with you. It's a management tool. It tells the executive, you have three branches, right? Two in this, well, you have two in this. You have the executive and you have the legislative body. So it's telling the executive what he or she can do with the monies in the budget. Maybe in a certain budget, there's going to be lots of, lots of money or more money on in, for infrastructure. In another budget, there might be more money for services like inside the, the parish or, you know, payroll. But the budget is a component of planning for how you want your town and your village to look. How does a government budget to spend some reserve funds? Now, I don't know if you're talking about reserve funds. Somebody just gave me this question. I don't know if you're talking about the um, fund balance or monies you think you're going to get in. But I'm going to say you decide how you have to decide how much of that. So let's talk about fund balance, your beginning fund balance. How much of that do you think you're going to need in order to meet the expenditures? You get extra money in, call it extra money, like FEMA money, American Rescue Act money, or some other monies that have already been put in there under the CARES Act, or some monies that you get on the grant for the uh, water system. All of those monies have to be budgeted. And how do, you bu how do you do that? Well, not just from the mayor sitting there deciding, put this here, put that there, put this in the other place. The mayor is the executive. He's the initiator. But the decisions on the budget, the decisions on the budget must be made by the legislative body and that would be the board or commission. So the day-to-day -day operations will go to the mayor as the executive, but he or she doesn't have a dollar to spend unless the monies are appropriated. Non-appropriated monies cannot be spent. There is no legal authority. Now, if you're really listening to me, you really are listening, you're going to say, mm, what about independently elected public officials? What about sheriffs? What about assessors? What about clerks of court? Well, they kind of, in that situation, they kind of are executive and legislative. And the statute says they have to follow the Local Government Budget Act, but obviously, they can't have a, a meeting of a body because there's no body. They have to have the initial public hearing, which I'll talk about, but they don't then present the budget to a body because they are the political entity. I hope that helps with that answer. And if it doesn't, then ask it again and we'll see if we can help further. Many parts of this budget are going to involve the word shall, S-H-A-L-L. -L. You say, why are you telling me that? Because in the law, there's a big difference between shall and may. If it says shall, that's mandatory. Most statutes, however, don't say you are mandated. They say, you political entity shall. Sh may is permissive. Shall, you have to do. So remember that as we move through 
these issues. Preparing the budget. Who has that responsibility? That's going to be the chief executive, the mayor, the head of the police jury, the executive director. Preparing the budget means they're going to be looking to the past. They're going to be looking at the present circumstances and they're going to look to the future. Looking to the past, the present and the future. The statute says you shall have a side-by-side -side comparison. Now, I'm going to tell you, when that went into, when the legislature proposed that about seven or eight years ago, I thought, why are they doing that? Well, I really think that is one of the times when the legislature was extremely, extremely on point. Sometimes you get they things can get kind of disheveled there, but not on this one. I think wise men and women did that because what I think they were hearing from their constituents is, I don't understand these numbers. I can't figure it out. It looks like a, a, a gobbledygook. So they said, do a side-by-side -side comparison. And we have put a template out there on our website, the auditor has, that we developed, Mike Battle referred to it yesterday, we developed between legal and advisory services. I got another question here. Um, recommendation on publication or resources to learn more about public budgeting and accounting processes specifically for small offices that have to do their own accounting. Well, I guess the best recommendation I would have for you, and this isn't tooting our own horn, but is to look at the best practices that advisory has out there, to look at advisory in the auditor's office, to look at our FAQs on budgeting, that legal is primarily responsible for, to look at the questions that have come in a database that we have about a thousand questions and lots of those are on budgeting. All of those things should help you. And here's, here's another help. And we've done this and, and, and I'm happy to do it or ask and work with, make sure that the auditor is okay with it and I feel like Mr. Wagesback, who's extraordinarily supportive of transparency and accountability, would say this was okay. We have gone to various places and done a special presentation, if you would, based on the unique circumstances of that place. So those are some ways I think we can help you. We have a new verification code and now we're up to 34, which is my current age. And that is 2298. And I want you to think I'm 98. So think of the 34. Second, 2298, code number 34. So you begin the preparing of the budget with, with the mayor, or I'm going to say the mayor, chief executive. Now, what the chief executive has an obligation to put together a letter, a statement of what he or she thinks the budget should be. So we look at this, that what the strengths are in that budget, what we think there might be some weaknesses and what issues have you had. Now, if you look at your budget your, your, those are the questions you should be asking, your budget message. If any of you need to look at a good budget message, we have some, we have a couple of them, and all you have to do is just give us a, shoot me an email or give me a call, and I'll, I'll make sure that you see a good budget message that we've reviewed that we think is excellent. But let's, let's just talk a little bit 
about the budget message. The budget message, if you have anything to do with preparing it, just say in plain English, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want this to say to the public, to your constituents, to your neighbors about this budget? And you say that, we lay it out. You say, what do, what do I think has happened over the past year? And what do we plan to happen in the future? And here's something unique and special. And then you give a sense of what monies will be coming in. So it's in the budget message of the mayor that you're gonna talk about. We have gotten additional monies because of the American Rescue Plan. We had additional monies last year because of the CARES Act. We think these monies will go on for one more year. That's a commitment that we have from the federal government. And here are some unique plans that we have for that money. You lay all of that out in a simple statement that, that can be read not by lawyers, not by CPAs, but by the ordinary person on the street, the person who reads or the newspaper or who looks at the uh, newspaper online. And you're going to want to account for, I'll just give you a heads up, in this year's new budget, you're going to be accounting for the American Rescue Plan money. You're going to be accounting for any FEMA monies that your town may have gotten or your parish may have gotten. You're going to be accounting for any insurance reimbursement monies that you may have gotten because of Laura or Ida or Delta. You're also going to be accounting, as you would in every year, for the taxes that you might have collected, the millages, some of which are restricted uses and some are unrestricted. You're also going to be within that kind of taxes, but sort of a, a another category, any bond issues that have to be paid off. You're going to be looking at all of the expenditures and you say, we have this pot of all the expenditures. You want to use a Christmas analogy. This is all the coal, but where's the gold? And then you start adding up, here's the gold, G-O-L-D. And here's what, how we're going to spend it. So this is really the mayor's, the chief executive's state of the state, if you would. Here's where we are. This message has to be posted for most people 15 days before the end of the fiscal year. Where is it put? It's put in the office, the main office, so that anybody who wants to can go look at it. It's sent to all the council who's going to vote on it. This is the budget message. This is the way, the beginning. This is the first step in the process. Now, I said transparency and accountability and light. So does the mayor, the chief executive have to do all of that on their own without talking to anybody, get their pencil and paper and start writing? No. If there's really, I think if, if they're real leaders, what they do even as they begin the preparation is to build consensus. So there might be a budget committee of the body there might be a planning committee of the body, or there might be both. And those are all public committee meetings. The committee of the whole is also a public meeting, posted agendas. And then all those ideas come together and the mayor, the chief executive puts them together and has what we call an executive preparation on all of that. Then what happens with it? It's there. And uh, it sits there 
and it sits there? No. If it's a budget of 500000 or more, 500000 or more, then there's going to be public input at a hearing. After the public hearing, there's going to be a legislative review and modification maybe, and then an enactment. And then the budget is executed. Then we have post-audit and evaluation. Now, we're going to kind of talk about all those in somewhat more detail, but I think you keep thinking about it as you begin to prepare it, you have a side-by-side -side comparison, you have a letter in words describing it, but then you have public input. Public input might mean I have to go back to the drawing board. At some point, you're going to go before the legislative body and you're going to discuss it again. And then the budget must be passed. Remember what I said in a little few minutes ago. No monies can be spent. Got that? No. No monies can be spent until they're appropriated. So we go through that process. Now, I understand I'm sitting here talking and it's kind of a two-dimensional world here. It's me and the paper. But you know, if you and I know I talk to many of y'all every day and, and luckily every month or so, and I know the budget process is full of intrigue and sometimes pain. So it doesn't go quite as smoothly. But these are the parts. These are the way it has to be done by law. What we hope is by everybody understanding the parts, we can understand what's essential and what, what needs to be what we need consensus for. You cannot have a budget if you don't develop consensus. You cannot have a budget if you don't realize that everybody has a little part of the truth. The political body and the chief executive then are, fun are furnishing or functioning as fiduciaries. That's kind of a summary. The political body and the chief executive are acting in the daylight. The political body and the chief executive must be aware of the substance of the budget because we need to talk about where have we been, where are we now, where are we going to go, but also the procedures. There's a time chart that we have in our materials that tells you exactly how you to proceed. And then the budget is adopted. And then amendments have to be adopted properly once the budget is adopted. See that side-by-side -side comparison? In case you want to know, you'll find that at 391305C2A. And what you're really doing, as I said before, in the side-by-side -side comparison, and the side-by-side -side comparison has to be with all your budget documents. That's just not something that you can leave out and do. It's a shall, not a may. It's a shall. So you'll have your letter from the chief executive. You'll have the budget itself and the side-by-side -side comparison. And I like to say it's what we, what we thought was going to happen. And then it records what actually happened and estimates of where we're going in the future. On the um, LLA's website is where that template is for the side-by-side -side comparison. That is not a shout. You don't have to use that template. But if you want to use that template, it maybe will help you or it'll help you to figure out how you want to do your template. Now, one person I haven't talked about, and I'll say person in a more 
totality, total sense, and that is the public. Key to any budget process is the public's participation in that process. So if you're a political subdivision or if you're an elected official, 15 days prior to the beginning of the fiscal year, then you're going to have to have the budget ready for public inspection at the office of the entity. If you are a parish, you have to have it ready 15, prior to the 15th day of the new fiscal year. Now, some people will a have asked me over the years, why? Why can't they just all do it at the same time? I just say, the police jury just had a better lobby. They wanted to wait longer to do their budget, and so they get a little, they get about 30 days longer than villages and municipalities. Um, now, say, okay, it's there, it's ready for people to look at. The curmudgeons of the world can go in and look at it. If it's a budget of $500,000 or more, 500000 or more, then there must also be a public hearing on that budget. Wait now, does it make your head hurt yet? Public hearing, public meeting. Why don't they just say an extra public meeting? Well, I can't tell you. I wish they did, but they call it the meeting for the public to consider the budget, which has been in the room of the chief executive for you to review. The meeting for that is a public meeting that has to be noticed. Ah, we got another verification code. And this one is 357719, verification code 357719. You wanna rack up all your credits, make sure you're writing that down in a way. So $500,000 or more, you have to have a public meeting, which is statute calls a public hearing no sooner than 10 days after publication. You say, uh, you never talked about publication in the official journal or a journal that covers the whole parish or the whole area you live in. It's a lot of, the official journal is kind of, we got it, they're gonna have to figure out something for that because so many newspapers have ceased to be in existence. But look at that and you, you publish it, you can't have the meeting any sooner than 10 days after publication. And after you do it, you have to publish that you have done it. So you certify completion of the process. Okay, you with me? $500,000 and over people, y'all gotta have a public hearing and then the public meeting on the budget. Can we just have the hearing? Huh? No, did the hearing and then the meeting. Okay, we have the hearing. I'm an elected official. Do I have a hearing? Yes. The sheriff goes to the hearing. He listens to what people say about his budget. Now, if that budget is drastically opposed at that meeting, probably somebody's going to be wise enough to say, let's don't go forward with the having a, a vote on the budget at the public meeting. But they're separate things, public hearing, then public meeting. Lots of times those occur on the same day, at the same time, you know, not the same time, but sequentially they go on. I'll take a sip of water here and maybe you can too. Now, in this public meeting, 
public meeting that's going to happen. Do you have a chance to speak at the meeting, at the council meeting? Absolutely. Now, if you're a Larson Act town, your amendment to that budget, this is the budget before it's adopted, has to be substantially close to what the budget looks like. If you're a school board, you can amend and amend and amend. If you're a drainage district, you can amend and amend and amend until you get to a vote. But if you're Larson Act, you can't do that. Your amendment has to be close to what you showed the people at the public hearing. If you're the elected official, you had your public hearing, you didn't hear anything that would make you think you had to really change the budget drastically. After that, you'll publish that just like the town would, that the certification that you went through the process. But then after that, you will send a letter, you will put it in a file, you'll certify in the file, not send a letter, you'll certify in the file that this is the budget for East Baton Rouge Share, for instance. Okay. When the budget is before the council, let's talk about when it's before the council. Well, let me give you this. That's just a review again of how, how this thing is going. The budget is available for review, 500,000 or more, you must have notice and publication. Now, let me just stop a second and say, it doesn't take much today to get a budget of 500,000 because it's, it's everything, right? It's the FEMA money, it's the ARP money, and it's whatever taxes you've gotten in, you know, it's a lot more. So, you, most of you are going to have a hearing and then a public meeting. But those of you who don't meet to that mark, you still have an obligation to have that budget considered at a public meeting. You still have the obligation to have to have the budget ready for everyone's review 15 days before that public meeting. So you're it's slightly different on the 500K, but it doesn't remove the obligation of the public hearing. Should the public entities, the public uh, hearing be posted on the entity's website? That's a great question. It may be posted on the website. I think it's awesome to do it on the website. Gives everybody notice of where this thing, what that this is gonna happen. I mean, raise the windows, you know, do everything you can to make sure that people know what's gonna go, what's gonna happen in the next few days for consideration of that. So the public hearing may be posted on the entity's website if you have one. When you post the public notice of the budget meeting, do you have to post the actual budget itself or just the notice of the meeting and the budget's availability for review? You don't have to post the budget itself. I think it's a really good idea on the notice for the public hearing to give a little summary of what's getting ready to occur. You know, doesn't mean you have to tell them Jennifer's salary is going to be X. But you might want to say the town is going to consider the budget where we're going to have, we're going to especially focus on changes in the infrastructure and costs for those changes, something like that. But you can also, and I think it's good to say, as this question per asks, um, where it is ready for you to look at the whole budget, but you don't have to put the whole budget in the publication. How do we certify completion of the project? Simple, plain English. 
you say we had a public hearing on October 21st at such and such a time where the budget of Town X was presented and no substantial am uh, amendments were requested. It won't say passed because that's not, that's the hearing, not the meeting. So that's something like that. Again, if you need help with that language and you call us, then I'm going to be more than happy to help you with that language. Except, here's here's somebody. I love this because I don't know the end. Well, I'll tell you what I explain the difference between a public hearing and a public meeting. Can they occur at the same time? The public hearing, think of it like this. We, we are from the Napoleonic Code tradition. We believe in community. We believe in family. We're not English common law. So think of the public hearing as a, ta as a time when you're bringing everybody in. If the, if the council wants to come, great. But where you're bringing everybody in so that everybody can have an understanding and can participate in the budget process. That's the hearing. The public meeting, which you, a lot of people do it this way, public hearing, then you notice you're, you've had an agenda for the meeting that'll say there's going to be a public hearing, then it's going to adjourn, it's in, in, then there's going to be the public meeting. They can one right after the other. The public meeting is a meeting of the body of the legislature of that particular entity, where they will then take up the budget and decide if they're going to pass that budget or amend that budget in some way. Remember, a Lorison Act, if they drastically amend the budget, you have to start all over again, in the opinion of the Attorney General. And I think that's a good opinion. So I hope that I've told you about that and that you're always going to have at least one public hearing, at least one, before they vote on the budget at the public meeting. Now, the budget at the public meeting, when they vote on it, they have to be ready to attach it to an ordinance right? That is the budget ordinance. Now, it gets a little dicey here, guys, but the ordinance in that town, you might say, says we got to introduce at one meeting, inter uh, wait two meetings to pass it. That's a separate process. So you say, I introduced it, it the ordinance, I waited, I held it over, and had waited the third meeting and we considered it. It would be at that third meeting then that you would attach the budget to the ordinance in a Lorison Act. If you're a drainage district, you don't follow that because you'll have resolutions rather than ordinances. If you're a low, if you're, um, if you have a legislative charter or you have a home rule charter, you might have some slightly different obligations when you pass the budget. Go through again the public participation. The public participation is done as an open meeting. The time of the open meeting, it's been noticed on the agenda of the open meeting that prior to the open meeting, we're going to have to, we're going to have a hearing on the budget. So really, you're having two meetings that night, two meetings. One is the public hearing, Napoleonic Code, I think, brings us to that. Second is the public meeting. Even if you're an elected official, you have to have the meeting. You can't have... I'm, I'm sorry, the hearing. They can't have the meeting, obviously, because you're not going to say, okay, I'm the sheriff. Okay, I'm the board. Okay, I'm the sheriff. You know, no, that doesn't make sense. But they're going to have the public hearing. 
the budget is over 500,000 or more. And all of these meetings, all of these meetings, you have a kind of a, a mantra, a tape running in the background, and that is transparency and accountability. Transparency and accountability. Uh, we got another verification code. I don't know, these are coming faster than they did yesterday. I don't know. But this is verification code number 36, and it's 4008. Verification code 36, 4008. So, public hearing, you've told them where to come. Now, remember, again, I know I don't mean to keep harping on it, but you'll be happy I harped on it if somebody challenges you. Do it in sunshine. That means they know when the meeting is. They know the time and the place of the meeting. You know the date, the time, the place. We have, if you don't have that, if you didn't post that, like Patrick has just told you about the posting of open meetings, then you don't have a valid meeting on the but uh, hearing on the budget nor a valid meeting after that so work on making sure that everything is posted accurately if it's not my best advice to you is if you messed up it's okay the world is not flat and you're not going to fall off of it but go back and get it right any questions that you might have on this budget process that we can help you with, you call us. Because this is such a critical function that if you don't have it or you'd have to delay everything because you've made a mistake, it can cause you to uh, really have heartburn. So let's go now and look more closely at adoption of the budget. Can a Lorison Act town adopt the budget by resolution? Answer, no. Lorison Act town must adopt a budget with their constitution. Must adopt it. At the beginning, can the budget be amended is Larson Act, it can be, but it must look like what somewhat like what they received. So let me give you an example. So Larson Act Town, they get a budget in from the mayor and it says we're going to have 50 people on the payroll. And they cut it down, they, the council, cuts it down to two people on the payroll. That looks like a fairly substantial change in the form of government. Gonna have to redo that, come back together. Now who gives up? I don't know. But somebody helps them to get to consensus. If you don't have a vote on the budget, if somebody thinks that they're gonna be the wise guy and not allow a vote on the budget because they can't stand the mayor, well, you might want to think about that two or three or four times. Because if there's no vote, that equals no budget. And it means that you have kicked in the all these other statutes that will come into play, the 5%, the 50%. And could not be a pleasant night for you. Now, we're at the point of adoption. The budget is presented. I see I have a few more questions here. All right, let's see what we got. How often is amendment required 
for an independent elected official? Is one amendment near the end of the year sufficient? Well, let's, let's talk about, let me just leave this slide up, but let's talk about an amendment, first question, an amendment required for an independent elected official. The sheriff has his budget plan, but somebody comes to his public hearing and says, you know what I really wanna to talk to you about, Sheriff? I wanna to talk to you about starting a drug program in the school. Here's how I think you could change the money around so that that can happen. Can he do that? Of course he can. He's an elected official. At his public hearing, he hears something that they want him to change. He can change that. He can change it before he's, he certifies that he's passed his budget and has a budget, a final but passed his budget, that he has found agreement after the public hearing. He's, he's made some changes. This is his budget. So he does that, and that's sitting in, in his office. Now, suppose he keeps going down the year and things change. I have less deputies. I have more deputies. I've had to switch money from category to category. So my suggestion on that, the law just says it has to be amended when there's a 5% change in revenue and expense. I don't think it's good, it's good uh, governance to make that change at the end of the year. I think if you take the concept that I've suggested to you, it's a living document, it's a legal document, then it makes no sense to wait till the end of the year to do it. It makes lots more sense to do it timely. Though you have the statute doesn't give you a time period, but if this something happens, uh, I would want to change it when close to the event occurring. So second question here, do we have to publish the public hearing notice three times prior to adoption? That's if that kind of notice is attached to your ordinance. If it is attached to your ordinance, then you have to do whatever you would do for any other ordinance or for any other financial ordinance. Do we have to have a quorum of the board to hold a public hearing? Not for a public hearing. The board members don't have to come to a public hearing, but you should have a quorum to hold a public, for the public meeting. Because without a quorum, you can't take a vote on the issue. And you certainly want to vote on, on the uh, budget. Okay, I'm getting, thank y'all. Thank you very much for giving me these questions. It's helping me. I'm learning more myself. Uh, for a hospital service district, does the board have to be part of the public hearing? Answer no. Or can that be overseen by the district executive? I don't think the board has to come to the public hearing. I think it's a good idea for the board to come to the public hearing because sometimes you'll, you'll hear something from the clerk from X place that's somewhat different. Here's a thing what ha more detail about what happens when the mayor and the board do not come together to get a budget adopted? Passed before the new fiscal year starts. And what happens when they spend 50 month plus over the last adopted budget? Well, I was gonna, I'm gonna answer that in a, in a little bit, but I'm gonna answer it now too. When they can't get, when they can't get 
Somebody just gave me a cough drop so you're not coughing in your ears. Um, they can't get a budget adopted. Then they can't find an amendment that they agree to to get an adopted budget. Then it's got to go back to the mayor, the executive to reconstruct. Can't get a budget adopted. Can keep, you know, the wheel keeps going on. It's like a hamster in there. That's a bad thing. Because with no adoption of the budget for the new year, there can be only spending up to 50% of the last appropriated budget as amended. That will cause, that will cause heartburn that you can't do that. So that's what the statute says. You can't, you can't, you can't do anything else. So what's that mean? It means you could be in a little town or a big city and not have police protection. You could be in a little town or a big city and not have the garbage collector because you can't make payroll. You've met that 50%. Hey, don't worry about it, people say. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take money out of the fund balance and put it up into those categories. Attorney General says no. When you get yourself to that point, he says, in his opinions, that you can't switch money around in categories. You have to stick with the categories that you have. So it's a stalemate. Might make somebody who causes stalemate feel really good about themselves and how powerful they are, but it's not going to be real pleasant on Monday when the garbage isn't picked up or when they have to park the police cars. When does the sheriff present his budget? Sheriff has a timeline, just like the local government has. Presents, he should have his budget available for inspection 15 days, 15 days, before the end of the fiscal year. So he doesn't have that component of the, uh, bo of the uh, legislative body, but all the other rules he has to follow. Don't forget, this is the part two where we talked about again that once you've had the hearing, then you have a, you certify that you had the hearing and that the budget was presented to the council. Now the council review, the council amendment, the council adopts, the council rejects, reviews the budget as presented. Can they amend the budget? Yes. They cannot amend it though if the law is enacted to where it no longer looks like the budget that was presented to them. But so what can they do? Well, say they had $25,000 in salaries or payroll, salaries and related expenses. They might say, no, we want to hire a new person. So let's put 30,000. Or they might have a category for professional expenses and they don't have anything in that. And they say, no, we think we're going to need a lawyer for redistricting this year. So they, they can do that. Once the council has done that, then it's up to them to adopt or reject the budget. Adopt or reject the budget. And that, that's a big step because if they reject it, they go home saying, ha, I told the mayor, ha, great. In about two weeks, they're not going to feel so great, maybe, if they've reached the 50% limit on that budget. Now, let's talk about monitoring implementation of the budget. Well, I sat in here yesterday when Mike gave his presentation, and I thought he did a great job. But, not but, 
because he was explaining best practices, monthly reports, and reconciliation of bank statements. That's what monitoring the budget means. That you're doing that so that you, you know exactly what this legal document is saying. Who can amend? Man, we got some, either we have people in here who are from the sheriff's office, or we got people in here who don't like the sheriff. Now my boss used to be a sheriff, and I, I love sheriffs. I hope he's listening and, and watching that because my little dog, Happy, has to keep eating. Um, the sheriff amends his budget. Verification code number 37 is 3010. Verification code 37 is 3010. Who can amend the sheriff's budget? Who can amend the DA's budget? Themselves. They can amend it when they see something that they think they have to do differently or when they have a 5% change in revenue or a 5% change in expenses or a 5% change in their beginning fund balance. Now, we're not talking in this amendment, remember this, we're not talking about um, a cash flow. A real 5% change is what we're talking about, okay? But monitoring implementation of the budget, how do you do that? Best practices, monthly reports, reconciliation of bank statements. And that's what Mike talked about. So the, all of those, as you're hearing that, if you're sitting on the legislative body, that might call for implementation of an amendment to the budget. So if it calls for that, then you begin it. And you know, just the question that y'all asked before, if it takes three meetings to amend the budget because it's an ordinance, then it takes three meetings and, and you get it done. It is not a good idea to wait until the end. I think, personally, it's legally improper because you're, you're spending money that from another category, not, not before you amend the budget to move the monies in to that category. The 5% variance is when you have a real change in revenue and expenses. I don't know how many of y'all got your ARP money before you had your budget adopted. I assume some people did, but there might be other people who got it after the budget was adopted for 21-22 fiscal year. So that would be something that would probably trigger an amendment to the budget because it's more than a 5% variance in your particular um, budget amount for revenues. If you were in monitoring, if you're monitoring the budget, you know, how do you do it? You do it by monthly reports, by bank reconciliations. What are problems in monitoring? Problems in monitoring happen when, when you just neglect to do it or when you have the wrong people doing it. What happens if you don't monitor? It's just like anything else. Anything that's not watched is going to go awry. And it puts you on the council in a very tenuous position. Some people would say it's malfeasance. That's a prosecutorial decision. But for sure, it makes for chaos. It makes for confusion. So you would try always to know exactly what you have, amend the budget as you're ongoing to get to understand better the implement, implementation of the budget and the changes in implementation. 
question goes right with this. Do you have to amend the budget if revenue exceeds 5%, but expenditures are within 5%? Yes. You have to amend the budget because it's a real picture and it's not real if if your your revenue is is very high some people would say well that i don't want to do all that so i'm going to put the revenue over in another spot we had an entity that did that and we asked the attorney general can they do that and he said no as you get the expenses or the expenses as you get the monies in you amend the budget so that it shows the real picture of what you have it doesn't mean anybody like in that case nobody was stealing the money they were actually doing excellent work with the money they got in from fema but it was just one person making the decisions and nobody any had the money in the separate account can't do that when you go to amend the budget it's just like any other action of the body you're going to give you you're not ever going to do it in secret you're going to give notice and then you're going to have the discussion at the meeting now for my friend who's been asking me about the sheriff guess what sheriff's going to have to do the same thing he says i want to amend the budget but he's going to do it with a little twist because he doesn't have a body to do it in a public meeting he's going to publish in the official journal he's going to he's going to put it there so everybody can see what he did with his budget he had 10 deputies he now wants to have 30 deputies and i have the money i got arp money from from whatever from the parish and we're going to do it at the council you're going to you're going to make that amendment be part of the open meeting and you're going to publish that amendment in the minutes of the meeting everything transparent everything in the light of day everything open all of the documents that I have been talking about are public records. Now, do not get yourself caught in a box where you said, I'm not letting them see the notes on my budget. That's it. They were my notes. Wrong. Remember, public, that six letter word, public. So if you don't want somebody to see it, do not write jennifer has stupid ideas because promise you someone's gonna have seen that you did that maybe even jennifer and she's gonna make a public records request for that document so in your process you have the budget as people wanted it amended the budget as it finally got amended and i say best practices is to do it close to the time when it needed to be amended. Okay. I love this little guy because he's so cute and he's working hard. When is, amend is amending mandated? It's mandated when you have this 5% change. 5% is more than just today we've got a little cash cash flow issue and when should it do be done close to the time close to the time when it actually happened so that at the next meeting you're going to see the legal document as it as it really exists and it gives everybody an idea they're telling me i have 10 minutes left so I want to make sure that all of y'all that want to ask me about the sheriff, ask me again.
in these 10 minutes. If you have a budget that's $500, $500, 500,000 or more, the chief executive, the mayor, has to give written notice to all the council about that amendment. But it doesn't matter if you don't have a budget that large, you still have to tell them about it. Personally, if I were the advisor to a mayor or if somebody still in a bit of craziness elected me mayor, I would say that you want to make sure even under $500,000 budget that everyone is given notice about a 5% issue. Can the sheriff use CARE Act money uh, for projects? It depends upon what the CARES Act says. You can use it for whatever the CARES Act says you can use it for. If you're talking about premium pay, there's lots of discussion on that today among public officials, especially among first responders. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna invite you to call and Angela Heath, who has the most direct knowledge about that, she and I will talk to you and help you to get that straight. Written notice mandated for $500,000 plus budgets. Thank you. Got another question here. Is under budgeting considered bad? And does it require an amendment? I guess what you mean under budgeting means um, you didn't put enough money in it or you put too much money in a category. It's an estimate. It's an estimate always. And so I don't think it's bad or good. I think it's just try to get it to be accurate to where you are right now. If you wanted to be conservative in your budget and so you thought you weren't going to have as much money or you know you didn't want to spend everything going to leave more in fund balance but now you want to do this then you're going to have to uh, amend the budget to do that so here's some um, miscellaneous budget issues I, I say I, I just tell you to Oh, we got, I bet you this is the last verification code. And that is 38, which is 7951. So it's verification 38. Now I'm going to tell you all the truth. That is my age, 7951. Okay. So here's one, the new source of revenue. You got, you got new sources of revenue coming in because the, the silver lining on COVID is CARES Act money, American Rescue Act money, and all those dollars have time periods on them. Um, you have money coming in because we've had this horrible catastrophic event of Ida. And so you'll have some money there. And all of that needs to be amended in to the budget. Another issue that I like, I don't like, I just think is that works into the budget. Another, another issue is emergencies. Do not create an emergency fictitiously. If it's a real emergency, then it's a real emergency and the budget doesn't constrain you from responding to that emergency but don't fictitiously create an emergency so that you're then spending money out of categories because of an emergency. Emergency is not bad planning. Emergency is something real has happened that you had no idea was gonna happen. And that is a regular emergency. That'll happen. An extreme emergency is my example, the water's coming in. 
remember about your fund balance. If you're using your fund balance to fund your current year expenditures, really amend that budget because that's not the way it ought to be. The fund balance should be something that you have there as exactly what it says, a fund balance. It's a savings, it's a reserve. If you find yourself taking from it on a regular basis, it means you need to really look at that budget. Here we go, we have another question. Question is, um, on this, I think I've gone over the emergencies and all of that, so I think I'm good on that. I'm going to get to those in, then, in a minute. Let me look at the question on the 50% limit due to no new budget passed. How is the 50% limit determined? 50%. $100 in payroll at the last appropriated budget, you have $50 to spend right now. You can't move budget, can't move monies in categories when you're in that realm. The AG opinions say it's that. How is it 50% determined? You got, a, you got an iPhone, you got a calculator, just add up the number. And, you know, I said this before in talk. I've been here in, in 22 years in January, and more than once I've had people call me and say, um, it's Friday, they didn't pass the budget, we can't make payroll. I said, I really think that's awful, and I do, but you have no legal authority to spend the money past that 50%. What if your grant-based accruals place your expenditure revenues outside of the 5% scope following the fiscal year and close? How do you correct this issue? Well, if you're, you're talking about uh, special revenue funds, special revenue funds are treated somewhat differently. If it's a reimbursement situation, then that 5% is not gonna apply. It's gonna apply if they're really grants that are coming in on uh, with with the money with the monies granted and then the expenditures, so that that's a little bit different. But I'd be happy to talk to you about your particular grant situation. So if it's a funding grant, then you're looking at I thought I was going to get X, I only got Y that made my expenditures be out of whack with, with the revenues. Two minutes, okay. Then here's the important issues that you have the proper budget adoption in, instrument, that you have absolutely have public participation, that your amendments are adopted timely and with the proper notice, that you have the right, right relationships for budget authority and control. The council is not the day-to-day. -day. The mayor, the chief executive is. You have no budget, you can't spend. You have emergencies, then you have to provide for it and certify it after you have, after you spend it. What's the penalty? I don't hate to leave you on this word, but it's called malfeasance. And if you don't look good in stripes, you might want to talk about it before you have to buy that striped outfit. I urge you to look at our flow chart in our FAQs, because I think that'll help you with the dates. I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for everything that you've done in sitting here and listening to us. What does the 5% mean? The 5% means a real change in revenues and expenditures. And I'm out of time. I'm, I'm very happy to have been here with you. 
I look forward to talking to you again. I look forward to having you call me. And I wish all of you and your families having have much health and that I don't have COVID. No one's, don't pass that around. I just cough a lot. But I wish you good news, good health. And uh, one of my favorite holidays is coming up. And if you want to be a witch, be a witch on the 31st, not other days. Take care.